All right, this next video will be focusing in on Japan, looking at the Kamakura period, into the Muromachi period, the Momoyama period, and a brief foray into the Edo period at the end. We'll be looking at military arts and feudalism in Japan. As you can see on the screen, we have the kind of feudal diagram there. We'll be thinking about the tea ceremony as well as Zen or meditation Buddhism, Zen gardens, and the dry landscape and how this particular type of garden has become very famous in the 20th and into the 21st century. So the Kamakura period, starting off, will be going from about 1185 to 1333. It's a period of intense warfare um, beforehand and then wars continue during the Kamakura period. The power shifts during this time from the Japanese emperor to the shogun. So this is an important change that you move from having essentially more of a military dictatorship with the emperor still around, you still have the ceremonial figurehead, but the political and military power very much rests with the shogun. So that's really where uh, the power lies. So you can see in this particular kind of triangular form, you have the emperor at the top as that figurehead, then the shogun who has that political and military power who becomes like the military dictator. Moving on to the daimyo, the nobles, the samurai, these significant warriors, these knights, ronin who were um, like samurai that had been defeated or didn't necessarily have a loyalty to a certain noble. Then you have the peasants, artisans, and merchants. So shoguns were great patrons of the arts, so we do find a lot of wonderful works of art that were commissioned by shoguns as well as other military leaders who maybe didn't reach quite the title of shogun. Uh, the first shogun of the Kamakura was Minamoto, so we're going to see a possible portrait of him in just a second. And let's move on to that right now. So here we see this portrait, Minamoto Yoritomo. However, this portrait has recently, some people believe that it now represents um, Ashikaga Tadayoshi, who is the brother of a later shogun. So we're not 100% sure, but if this is Minamoto Yoritomo, it would be the it would be the portrait of the founder of the Kamakura shogunate. Uh, if it is again this portrait, it's a 13th century copy of an 1179 painting. It's attributed to Fujiwara no Takanobu. It's a hanging scroll, so that same kind of hanging format that we've seen before with ink and color on silk. The title of shogun was bestowed by the Chinese or excuse me the Japanese emperor. Um, again, that idea that he's that figurehead and he does provide that um, that title to the shogun but it probably was more of a forced like you need to name me shogun and then the emperor would do it uh, during the Kamakura period there is some increased contact with China we'll talk about the Mongol invasions in just a few minutes and there is this introduction of Zen or meditation Buddhism in Japan we've already talked about the idea of Zen in China so Zen was called Chan Buddhism and it's this idea of heavy emphasis on meditation also um, a heavy emphasis on reaching enlightenment through mundane activities. Let's look a little bit at this particular portrait, whether it is Minamoto or it is Ashikaga. Again, we're not 100% sure, but there's some great changes from the Haiyan period. So the Haiyan period, um, individual individualized features, were they tended to be very generalized. We didn't see a lot of individualized features. Uh, so you'll remember from looking at the tale of Genji, it was kind of hard to tell who was who. But here we're seeing more of those individualized features and very distinct dress. So you see this really distinct kind of boxy dress that he's wearing. And we continue to see this in other sculptures of Minamoto that come along later. So you see this kind of very inflated dress that gives him a great presence. He's really filling the composition. Also, even though he's wearing this very austere black, there's still this richness to the textile. You can see all this wonderful detail on the garment itself. You can also see a great interest in pattern in other areas surrounding Minamoto, if that's who this is. You can see a very distinct pointed cap, black cap that he's wearing. You can see that he's rather young in this particular portrait. He's also holding a ceremonial board called a shaku and then the hilt of his sword reminds us reminds us of his military prowess uh, again very austere very black and kind of calm colors but there are these peaks of rich colors such as the red that peaks out from around his neck little bits of red down here so there's a wonderful richness to the textiles because warring culture was so important around this time, of course, suits of armor become very important and very much objects for a lot of artistic detail. So these suits of armor needed to be um, beautiful enough for the kind of important warrior culture that 
that they had in Japan at this time, but also kind of light enough that they could move around in them. Of course, they also had to protect the wearer. Some suits of armor uh, are more ceremonial or ritualized, but many, of course, were used in actual warfare. So this one's made of lacquered iron and leather. We also have silk and stenciled leather that it, that's included and some copper gilding. So you can get a sense of how expensive these would be. Um, these wonderful suits of armor are very much sought after by collectors. So some collectors, they really want to focus on just samurai armor. They just want to focus on Japanese armor. So this comes from the early 14th century. So we're getting towards the end of the Kamakura or late Kamakura period. It does have these elements to protect the wearer, and then it also has a representation of Furumayo, who I'll show you a detail of that. Here it is. You can see Furumayo surrounded by flames. These are purifying flames. You can also see here uh, he's holding a sword, which is supposed to cut through ignorance and delusion. He also has a rope in his hand, which is supposed to be a sign of reigning in violent passions and evil. He's known as the immovable one, so similar to how many Japanese warriors would have wanted to be seen, that, you know, they wouldn't be moved by violent passions, they wouldn't, they'd be very serious and steadfast, and nothing could move them, and uh, nothing could affect them. So he's the immovable one and the symbol of the steadfast warrior spirit. So this really demonstrates how these suits of armor could become places of artistry with all the details that could be added. So again, Fudumayo is right here, and then that was just a detail. All right, moving on to a hand scroll. So again, this idea of a hand scroll that you would read from right to left, and then you would also just look at it a little bit at a time, kind of unrolling, almost like a film before your very eyes, of course, in a time before film existed. Uh, in any case, you can see that this is this illustrated history of the Mongol invasions from the late 13th century. There were two major Mongol invasions into Japan. You, of course, will recall um, the, Mong the empire of the Mongols was rapidly spreading. They had taken over China during the Yuan dynasty uh, with Kublai Khan. And so you have this interest in more and more people coming into, um, or this interest by the Mongols to continue expanding. So going from Korea and trying to go onto the Japanese islands. And so the Mongol invasions in 1274 and 1281 were ultimately unsuccessful. And so it's thought that the Japanese fighting was pretty successful, but also uh, the Japanese believed that divine winds, or what they called kamikaze, uh, had saved them. So it was believed that the Shinto gods had kind of come in and created these bad weather conditions that led to the Mongols being unsuccessful. In this particular hand scroll, the goal was that a particular Japanese officer, Takizake Sunaga, who we see here, um, commissioned this so that he would receive payment for the fact that he went into battle or he went to battle against the Mongols to record it in a visual format. So we see him here on his horse. The horse has been struck. Blood is pouring out. You can see that they both look wounded. Um, and you can see the clear difference between the way the Mongols fight with their poisoned arrows and their kind of ceramic exploding projectiles versus the highly ritualized ceremonial style of the Japanese warriors. So the the when the apparently when these two groups encountered each other, just the way they fought was so so different. And I think that's really indicated here with kind of the simplicity of the uh, the the dress of the Mongols versus what this Japanese warrior is wearing, what Japanese officer is wearing. Um, so this is just one section of the hand scroll. There is more to it, but I'm just showing you this particular scene to uh, to really show you the difference between uh, the Mongols and the Japanese when they were fighting one another. And ultimately, the Mongols were unsuccessful in conquering Japan. And, and Japan always presented some problems because obviously you're out on an island, so it's it became much more challenging than some other areas areas of Asia. Right. Moving on, we're going to talk about a additional, an additional historical period as we move into the Muromachi period. So the Kamakura shogunate collapses in 1332. Kamakura was basically the capital of this period, so that's an actual city. Then we move into the Muromachi period, which is based in Kyoto. So we're moving to another city. Again, this was common to kind of move the capital around based on who was in power. This is when the Ashikaga clan rises to power, and this is when Zen Buddhism also gains in popularity. So Zen meeting meditation, it's popular among warriors, dedicated monks, aristocrats, and merchants, and this was probably due to the fact that it emphasized austerity, self-discipline, respect for nature, and of course the emphasis or the importance of meditation. It's called meditation Buddhism, so there you go. 
So we start to see um, more Zen inspired painting, which tends to avoid very bright colors. So let's look at an example of them. This is one of the most famous by Josetsu called Catching a Catfish with a Gourd. And the whole idea here is it's very hard to catch a catfish with a gourd. So it essentially reflects what's called a Zen koan, these kind of questions or exchanges which don't really have an answer. So kind of a question of how do you catch a catfish with a gourd? There's not necessarily an answer to that. Um, another example of a Zen koan would be, what's the sound of one hand clapping? You know, it's something that gets you thinking, something that gets you meditating. So you see this figure here down below who looks really rugged, he's on a landscape, and you see him with a gourd in hand with the idea of how is he going to catch this particular catfish? Of course, he's not going to be able to do it, but it's something perhaps you could hang on the wall. It is still within a temple complex today, um, a Buddhist temple complex. This idea of hanging it on the wall and contemplating the scene. How do you catch a catfish with a gourd? Um, it's relatively substantial in size, so 32 inches, almost 33 inches. Again, it is in a temple complex. It dates to 1413 and reflects the saying of the heart cannot be grasped or giving you this question of something you're, you're unable to do. It was painted as a screen for a shogun from the Ashikaga clan, so he wanted the uh, single leaf screen in the new style, so this kind of new Zen painting style which tended to reject Ex, you know, extensive colors, very elaborate decoration, and you can see that it also includes 31 poems by Zen priests. So this is often seen as a wonderful early example of this type of Zen painting. So um, Josetsu had a student named Shobun, Shubun, you see that name here, and then Shubun's student was Seshu Toyu, Toyu. and so you see Seshu's work here. Um, this is dated to 1496, we've moved to the latter part of the 15th century, and this particular painting is called Eka, showing his severed arm to Daruma. So Daruma was an Indian monk who came to China in about 1520 and became the first patriarch of Chan, or Zen Buddhism. Remember, Chan is the Chinese form, Zen is the Japanese form. Daruma did a nine-year meditation on Mount Song. So we see him sitting within this cave and just staring at the wall of the cave, with the idea being here that he's doing this for a very, very long time, and of course this is leading to, uh, he's hoping to get to enlightenment by staring at this blank wall. He's kind of helping himself there. Uh, and essentially his body is atrophying because he sat in this spot for one for so long. So you can see his body just kind of melting away into the ground. And Ika was a Chinese individual and he's considered the second patriarch of Chan. Uh, and he really wanted to become essentially a like a student of or a, someone who was a follower of Daruma. And so in order to demonstrate his strong belief, his desire to reach enlightenment, and his desire to kind of train with Daruma, he actually cut off his arm. And so you can see this severed arm that he's holding out. And if you don't know to look for it, you probably wouldn't notice it, because it's not bleeding or anything, it's not particularly a violent scene, but it's this reminder that there was someone who was so willing and so much wanted to train with Daruma, this really important figure in Zen Buddhism, this founder, um, that he was willing to cut off his own arm. So you can just see that severed quality here. So Seshu's work, I'm always really struck by his painting style. He had um, two types, so he had the Shin style, which was more a hard, sharp, and angular style. You can see that use of the Shin style on the, the wall of the cave, so those kind of angular marks to create this wonderfully jagged appearance, and then these bold brushstrokes to create the outline of Daruma. There's also this interest in creating an ethnic difference here, so the fact that Daruma is Indian and Ika is Chinese, so you have this difference that's indicated through their faces and through their coloring. Um, but anyways, a very distinct style and also very confident style, just that application of these different brush strokes to outline the figures and to create these wonderful effects on the cave wall. 
Another wonderful work by Seshu is more of this soft style. So we also have the so style, the simplified style of, of splash dink. And that's very much what we see here. So Hatsuboku just means splash dink. So this is Hatsuboku landscape for Soen. And Soen was a disciple of Seshu. So in this one also, we're at the end of the 15th century and you very much can see this idea of a splash dink landscape. There's kind of a randomness here, again, of a really restricted palette because we're just seeing the use of ink and this is on two joined sheets of paper you can see most of it is calligraphy and inscriptions at the top and then the splashed ink styles at the bottom you can just barely see the outline of the mountains this kind of light splashing of ink in the background you can see the indication of a tree or vegetation some buildings a wall here and individuals in a boat and so the artist's inscription is, my eyes are misty and my spirit exhausted. And there's also an inscription by a Buddhist monk that kind of describes the scene. Whenever I show this to students, they're always a little mystified as to what we're seeing here. But as you look at it, I think more of the details come become apparent. So you have, within the wayside village, a wine flag flutters in the wind. A man grasps his oars in the calligraphic boat. Oh, hello. There we go. In the calligraphic boat right here. Got excited there. This brushwork from the height of intoxication is endlessly inspiring. The southern mountain is veiled with mist in the evening dusk. So you can see that there as well. So those paintings could be a great way to encourage meditation. Another way to encourage meditation are these dry landscapes. This is from Roenji, a temple in, uh, in Kyoto. And these have become very much kind of a fascination of the Western imagination. We've talked about that before in videos, but just the idea that now people have these kind of Zen gardens on their desks. You can see these being sold at like museum gift shops. Um, but these are, this is now an incredibly popular tourist attraction in Kyoto. Um, and the temple itself is really gorgeous, but everyone comes to see this particular dry landscape. So let's think about the landscape and kind of what it means and what's going on here. So uh, the dry landscape is generally intended not to be walked upon unless you're actually raking it or you're weeding it, you're pulling up the weeds. And of course, if you're doing that, that can be an action to encourage meditation. So kind of that gentle action of raking and organizing and weeding those everyday practices. That's something that Zen says can, can help you reach enlightenment. Um, but for the most part, individuals are supposed to sit along the outside of the garden and look at it and help use it to help encourage meditation. Um, so many people talk about how the rocks are supposed to symbolize land. These kind of larger rocks and the mossy outcroppings are supposed to symbolize land or island that are sitting within these smaller rocks and the smaller rocks are supposed to symbolize water. We don't have any documentation that says that that's for sure, but it is a possibility and we do see some connections between the way that islands and rocks are represented in paintings and the way we see it in this dry landscape. Obviously, um, like some of the other gardens we've looked at in these videos, it is very much a man-made work, but it's still affected by nature. You can see how the wall behind has become mottled or muddled and discolored, how it's changed over time. Obviously, the moss is going to grow in unpredictable ways, although you can, you know, kind of trim it and help deform it and encourage it to grow certain ways. You can't necessarily tell it exactly what to do all the time. Um, so you still are kind of at the mercy of of the natural world. So again, the interpretation is not 100%, we're not 100% sure, but there is some idea that the small rocks symbolize water, the larger rocks symbolize land, as well as those, those kind of mossy outcroppings. Other symbolic interpretations have been suggested, um, but that's the one that's most frequently repeated. And most of all, it's intended as a meditative space, generally for those who are sitting on the outside, and then occasionally those who work at the temple actually go on and rake it or um, pull the weeds and make sure that the space is kind of clean and clear. Uh, but it's not supposed to be a place for kind of parties or hanging out or um, moving around extensively. It's very much a meditation space. 
All right, so finishing up our last few periods, the Momoyama period going from 1573 to 1615. This is where we see warlords struggling for power and building large palatial residences. We'll see a particular castle. Um, and then briefly, we'll see the Edo period, which goes from 1615 to 1868. At the end of the Edo period, the shogunate is actually abolished and the emperor is restored to power. So you can see that for hundreds of years, the shogunate was very much in power in Japan, um, and so it takes all the way to 1868 to kind of have this restoration back to the emperor. So during this period of great warfare, um, there was this desire for a way to escape and a way to enjoy the refined beverage of tea. And so you have this individual named Sen no Riku who was a tea master. He was considered the great tea master and he really appreciated a more kind of rustic and austere approach to enjoying tea. Tea was considered a very elite beverage. It started off as something that monks used to help keep them awake when they were meditating. We do have some accounts of people using it more like for parties because it was so caffeinated and so I guess they would have a great time and drink tea. But in Japan, in this period where so much is ritualized and so much is made formal, um, the, the drinking of tea becomes a very particular ritualized ceremony. And Senyu Riku develops this kind of tea house and this precise way that the tea house should look. And of course, it's very austere, very humble. Um, you have, let's look at the kind of axiometric view here. So here you can see the axiometric drawing down here. Um, you would actually crawl through a small door, the idea of humbling yourself and essentially being reborn into this small space, you would have the niche or alcove called the tokonoma, and you can see that um, generally you might have some hanging calligraphy, Riku recommended flowers, very natural looking flowers. Of course, all of this would be changed out very regularly. The idea is to keep the space pretty clear. Um, you would change things out rather than putting everything in there. Generally, you'd have two tatami mats, so this mat flooring, again, keeping things pretty simple and very small. So again, two views of that same kind of tea house. Here's an exterior view of the structure where you can get a sense of that simplicity. So the tea ceremony in Japan is known as cha no yu, or hot water for tea. Some people call this the way of tea. Um, the founder in Murata Shukyu, Shuk in 1422, living from 1422 to 1502, designed the first tea ceremony and the first tea house for the shogun. Again, this provided a means for escape and kind of this ritualized practice that also engaged with kind of meditation in some ways, so there were some nice connections to Zen. The most famous tea master who we've already mentioned was Riku, who died at the end of the 16th century. Uh, the tea ceremony required harmony, respect, purity, and tranquility, and you had these strong concepts of sabi-wabi, which are often discussed in relation to the tea ceremony. So sabi is uh, the beauty of what is worn and rustic, there's very subdued taste rather than garish over the top desires. Wabi is cultivated poverty, a refined austerity. So some basic steps in the tea ceremony, guests should approach the tea house, purify their hands, cleanliness is really important. You enter the tea house, if it's a Riku style tea house, you would bow down and kind of be reborn into the space. You sit on those tatami mats, you admire the niche that holds calligraphy or a flower arrangement. The host arrives and wordlessly prepares the tea, so this isn't a time for gossip or chit chat. The pre preparation of the tea takes a great amount of time, so there's kind of the warming and cleaning of things. Um, you want to make sure that the water boils, so the arrangement of the charcoal is very important. These kind of burning coals is really important. The guests drink their tea, they admire the beauty of the utensils, and then the guests depart. So again, this very ritualized type of activity. A type of ceramic that became very popular is called raku, and so you see an example of black raku here, relatively small, 3.5 inches. This is by Honami Koetsu, and this particular tea bowl is one of the most famous. It's named after one of its owners, whose name was Shichiri, um, from the early 17th century. So it's kind of Momoyama into the Edo period. So I've expanded it quite a bit, but you can see how it looks like something that's really just come from the earth, this really natural creation. You get a sense of how you could hold it in your hands and it would just kind of melt, you would, you would feel like a part of your hands because it feels so organic and kind of smooth on the side. Uh, 
in this particular case, there's apparently a design carved into the bottom. So when you would finished your tea and you're examining this utensil, you're examining your tea bowl, you would see these additional designs. You can see also that um, Honami Kuetsu has left certain parts of the clay exposed. So it's covered with this kind of iron glaze, but um, bits of the clay are left exposed. And there were all these different practices of uh, you know, creating these pots not, or creating these tea bowls and not necessarily using a wheel so that you're creating these more inconsistent forms. Also trying all these different experiments with glazing in order to create this really natural effect. So that's definitely something that we see in this particular case. So the type of structures that these kind of warlords or these military officers uh, were living in were often very large castles in order to ensure that if there were attackers, they would be protected. One of the best castles that survives today is Himeji Castle, which means white heron, and it really does look like this kind of fluttering white bird that seems to hover over the landscape. It's in Himeji near Osaka in Japan, and uh, it was one of the only palaces to not be attacked, and so that's why it's in pretty darn good shape. Um, so anyways, you can see that it was created around 1580. The initial patron was Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who was a very famous general. Um, he began some quests into Korea that didn't necessarily work out, trying to conquer areas of Korea. Um, but he was an important military leader, but wasn't, wasn't named Shogun. It's made of wood, plaster, and stone. And some of the most interesting features, besides this kind of wonderful hovering quality, the white, the white hovering quality of this white heron uh, castle, is that as you approach the castle, you really are supposed to get kind of lost and confused. So that's this maze-like quality because if you're an attacking army, they don't want it to be easy for you to approach this particular castle. They want to make it challenging to reach this this castle. And obviously it's very vertical, so you would get this great view at the top. You would be able to see uh, who's coming, if anyone's coming to attack you. But in addition to that, uh, it, it keeps you safe, like so you could go as high as possible and keep yourself safe. There are these wonderful slits that are carved into the side of the palace so that they could shoot arrows or they could pour hot liquids onto those who were attacking. Um, there are these geometric cutouts that are very large on the inside and then very small on the outside. So obviously, if you were on the inside of the castle, you could shoot your arrows or you could attack those on the outside, um, but you wouldn't necessarily receive arrows from those who are attacking you. Um, firearms were introduced into Japan in 1540 by the Portuguese. So there had been earlier introduction by the Chinese, but kind of wasn't widely adopted until the Portuguese introduction in 1543. So we are at that time when firearms are starting to be used more regularly as well. So a last work of art to think about, this one from the Momoyama period from 1590, so around the time of Hameji Castle. So with this castle architecture, the interiors tended to be rather dark, um, and also the patrons of these castles really wanted to show off their wealth. And so a great way to do that was through these screens that were often covered in gold leaf. So they carried on the tradition of paintings that we often see in East Asia that show a great appreciation for landscape, for the natural world. And so this is um, an example where you are seeing that appreciation for the natural world, but it also includes this kind of these, these squares of gold leaf. So this originates from the Kano school. So Kano Etoku was one of the most important painters from this school. This school originated in the 15th century, but went on for hundreds of years after that. Um, and you can just get a sense of how this type of screen really would speak to wealth because you literally have these, um, these screens covered in gold and again how it would help to illuminate the space, space with great warmth. If we go back to these castles, obviously the windows are not very big because they want to protect the space. They want to make sure that people, you know, can't get in and that they're protecting themselves should any kind of attack happen. Uh, so what you can do is try to bring more light into the inside. And so these golden screens, which were produced in, in massive numbers, um, were often very popular. So you can see there's a lovely blue of the water. You can see a rocky outcropping here. You can see what looks to be kind of a cliff form, another rock emerging here. The gold is really supposed to be 
um, the clouds that are moving through the water or moving over the water and through the mountains or through these rocky outcroppings. You can also see gold indicating the land that this very gnarled or kind of twisty uh, cypress tree is, is growing out of. And Cyprus was often seen as a symbol um, for strength, but also kind of old age, the ability to endure. So you can see it looks like this tree has been through a lot. It has this twisting form. It looks like it has bits of um, you know, things growing on it and it's kind of twisting in all directions, but it's still alive. You still have that kind of evergreen quality and these new branches that are emerging out. So this idea that even something that is older, that has been through a lot, um, can still continue to survive and to be beautiful. And you have this wonderful contrast between the kind of straight lines of the rocks and the kind of twistiness of this particular tree that dominates the front of the composition. So just a wonderful example of how these um, military leaders would decorate their very large but very dark castles. All right, our next video will move into more east-west exchange, thinking about um, both China and Japan. So look forward to that in a few days.